All right, welcome everyone. Um, this is the re-recording of Dismantling Rape Culture and Empowering Consent. Uh, this training we did uh, in partnership with the University of Arizona. Um, and I'm re-recording it just because there were some technological difficulties the first time around, and I wanted everyone to be able to listen to it without that technological difficulty. Um, so without any further ado, I will go ahead and get started. So my name is Victoria Rikers, I use she, her pronouns, and I am one of the sexual violence response coordinators with the Arizona Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence. Uh, at the Arizona Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence, we provide training uh, and education about sexual and domestic violence. We provide technical assistance to programs. Uh, we also have a helpline, which I'll talk more about at the end, that's available for survivors, friends and family of survivors, um, and people working with survivors to call. Um, and we also do public policy advocacy um, at the coalition. So feel free to reach out to us if you would like more information about what we do at the coalition. And then before I get started, I also just want um, to give a trigger warning for this training. Uh, there will be some potentially disturbing images um, and we will be watching some videos, but I don't believe the videos have um, disturbing imagery. Uh, for the most part, um, but we will uh, have that on the screen today. So I just want to give you all a heads up. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge that uh, I also have a, a good deal of privilege when I am giving this presentation uh, and in my life in general. Um, I am a cis white woman um, and I will be talking about uh, the different ways that rape culture can affect different communities, um, some of which I'm a part of, um, and some of which I'm not a part of. Um, and so there may, be thing, there may be things that I get right, there may be things that I get wrong, uh, and then I have privilege of having um, the power of this presentation and giving this presentation today. Um, so feel free to send me any feedback that you have. Um, if you would like to, my contact information will be at the end of the presentation today. All right, so just so that we're all on the same page, I first want to talk about what is sexual violence. So at the coalition, we describe sexual violence um, as any sexual activity that takes place without the consent of everyone involved in that activity. All right, and we use an umbrella uh, when we're talking about sexual violence because uh, it's a very, very broad term. Uh, and there are many different things that can fit under this broad term of sexual violence. So of course we have rape. Uh, when we're talking about rape, we're often talking about how rape is when someone is penetrated by someone else. So their body uh, is penetrated by another person's body or by an object. Um, we also have stalking. Uh, so stalking can have a sexualized component to it. Uh, so we would include that as a form of sexual violence. Uh, sexual exploitation, so sexual exploitation um, can be things like sex trafficking, non-contact unwanted sexual experiences. Um, non-contact unwanted sexual experiences will include any sexual experience um, that does not have the consent of everyone, uh, that does not involve physical contact, right? So this could include things like forcing someone to watch pornography, or um, if someone uh, is masturbating at someone else, right? But there's no physical contact. Sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is another very broad term that can range from non-contact um, experiences, unwanted sexual advances, to sexual assault and rape uh, with, where that penetration happens. Uh, and we often think of it as happening in the workplace uh, or in schools. Um, and we also talk about sexual harassment as street harassment. We also have made to penetrate on here. So made to penetrate is when someone is forced to penetrate someone else. So they're either forced to penetrate someone with their own body or they're forced to penetrate them with an object, uh, right? And the reason we have this distinction between rape and made to penetrate um, is just because a lot of the statistics break it out that way. Um, and so we have that for clarity when we're talking about statistics. Um, so rape is when someone is penetrated and then made to penetrate is when someone is forced to penetrate someone else. Uh, we have unwanted sexual contact. So 
this is any type of physical contact uh, that's sexual that's unwanted. So this could be um, sexual touching, this could be sexual kissing, anything like that. And then last on this slide, we have sexual coercion. So sexual coercion, uh, we have as a form of sexual violence, but it's really more of a tactic of sexual violence, right? Um, it is when someone is pressuring or manipulating someone into having sex. Um, and so it's pushing past someone's no. Um, it's um, using emotional manipulation uh, against someone. So um, saying things like, well, if you want to have sex with me, then I think we should break up, right? Um, your tease, right? That, that sort of thing. Um, to try to pressure someone um, into having sex when they don't want to. Uh, and this is um, the most common form, uh, the most common tactic of sexual violence. Um, so we have that on this, uh, the screen here to make sure that's included in our, in our conversations about sexual violence. So I really briefly want to go through some statistics. Um, so every 73 seconds, someone in the United States is actually assaulted. So this is a very, very um, broad number, right? It's a very large statistic. To break it down a little bit, um, I have one in three women and one in six men have experienced contact sexual violence in their life. Uh, one in three women and one in eight men have experienced non-contact sexual violence in their life, right? So both of these numbers are very, very high um, for both any type of physical sexual violence and any type of non-physical sexual violence. I also have uh, one in two transgender and gender non-conforming individuals have experienced some form of sexual violence in their life, right? And I have this on the slide here um, because in the, stu the national studies that we have um, that are not trans-specific, most of the time they do not specify if they interviewed trans individuals or not. Um, and so the assumption that uh, we might make is that they did not interview uh, trans individuals because they did not record it. Um, and so I wanted to make sure those individuals were included when we are talking about the rates of sexual violence. And we can see that trans folks experience sexual violence at significantly higher rates um, than um, others. And then we also see that one in six girls and one in, sorry, one in four girls and one in six boys have experienced child sexual abuse as well. When it comes to those who hold oppressed or marginalized identities, we also see that these groups experience higher rates of sexual violence, right? So LGBTQ folks, people with disabilities, immigrants, people of color, and especially multiracial folks, indigenous folks, bisexual folks, and trans folks experience high rates of sexual violence. A lot of the times, um, adult victims and child victims know their perpetrator, right? So 80% to 90% of adult victims, they know their perpetrator. And then it's even higher for children, 95% know their perpetrator. Um, and this is a really important um, statistic we like to discuss because uh, there is a significant myth that it's strangers who are committing sexual harm, um, but it's actually the people that survivors know who are more often committing sexual harm. We also know that most victims are targeted, right? So when someone uh, is perpetrating sexual violence, they think about these different aspects of a survivor's identity, right? So they will look at how accessible the survivor is to them, right? They'll look at how vulnerable the survivor is. And they'll also look at the survivor's credibility. So if the survivor will be believed if they come forward or if they won't be believed, um, the people who commit harm are thinking about some of these things. Um, and so I want you all who are listening today to think about what are different populations or different behaviors, anything like that, that could um, increase accessibility, increase vulnerability uh, to sexual violence and decrease someone's credibility, right? So what would be in this triangle on the screen here? Um, so I have given this presentation several times and some of the most common ones that come up are children and youth. Uh, we also uh, frequently people will mention people with disabilities, uh, people who are experiencing houselessness, 
um, and sex workers, um, right? So if someone um, is a sex worker and they report sexual violence, oftentimes they aren't believed, right? Because of the nature of their work. Um, other things that um, we also hear uh, when I give this training is if someone's using drugs or alcohol, right? So that's something that can temporarily um, increase vulnerability, uh, right? Uh, and decrease credibility potentially. And so um, perpetrators are thinking about these things and potentially looking for these things when they are thinking about perpetration. All right, and then when we talk about sexual violence, we always talk about the root cause. So the root cause of sexual violence is power. Um, this is not to say that there isn't um, a sexual component to sexual violence. Sometimes there is um, a sexual component as well in terms of the motivation of why someone's um, causing sexual violence. However, at the end of the day, it is always about power in, in every case. Uh, right, so a few years ago, um, there was a target in Peoria, Arizona, uh, where a man was um, caught going around the target with a selfie stick, taking photos of women's skirts. Um, and he was apprehended, and the photos um, that he took were actually all blurry. Um, and when this happened, we had a lot of um, media requests asking us why did he take these photos if they were all going to come out blurry like what was the purpose and the purpose was to humiliate those women to invade their space and their privacy um, and to make them feel powerless right so it was all about that power it didn't matter that the photos were coming out blurry uh, and that whether or not they'd be used later for something else right or if they would be uploaded somewhere right what mattered was um, in the moment, how um, those women were feeling and how um, the perpetrator was getting off on uh, harassing those women in that way. All right, so before we really get into what rape culture is, first we need to talk about culture. So culture is a shared set of values, beliefs, rituals, and norms that influence all aspects of life, right? So today we're really focused on American culture, like mainstream United States American culture. But all of us have, uh, all of us belong to multiple cultures, right? Uh, to different subcultures that may be based in our identity, where we're from, our ethnic group, our sexual orientation, um, all of that. Um, we can call subcultures, right? So someone might um, identify with queer culture, right? And there's um, different things about their identity related to that. Um, I'm from the Midwest, right? And so there's a distinct culture in the Midwest um, that I am a part of uh, and that folks who are not from the Midwest may not be a part of or aware of. Um, another thing we need to talk about uh, before really getting into uh, rape culture is privilege. Uh, right, so I talked at the beginning about some of the privileges I hold, um, but privileges are advantages, rewards, and or benefits given to those in the dominant group without members of the dominant group asking for them, right? So um, the dominant group, um, I like to describe as the group of people who are in power, um, and the dominant group is typically uh, the most normal, uh, if you think of like the most normal quote unquote person in the whole world um, or in the whole United States, what would they look like, right? So typically we think of white, male, cisgender, heterosexual, uh, able-bodied, college educated, uh, Christian, right? Some of those different identities. Um, and that is, so those are some of the different dominant groups that we have um, in the United States. And when we talk about privilege, we wanna talk about it because sometimes um, members of the dominant groups don't realize that they have these privileges um, in ways that people who belong to oppressed identities definitely realize, um, right? And that's something that comes up frequently when we're talking about rape culture and we're talking about um, different gender-based stereotypes. So I have um, on the screen here, just kind of an example of what this can look like. So um, 
the ways that um, different oppressed groups can be disadvantaged uh, in ways that dominant groups don't realize or uh, aren't seeing, right, because they are not members of those oppressed groups. And this is a, a very simplified map um, and is not all inclusive, it's just a few examples. So if we start with a person of color, um, a few things that we might see is we have in this country historic and ongoing discrimination against people of color, especially against Black and Indigenous people, uh, as well as Latinos. Um, but like in this country, we have um, a history of slavery, a history of Jim, Jim Crow laws, segregation, all of that, uh, and also a history of redlining. So redlining is when neighborhoods were, uh, someone took a map and drew a red line around certain neighborhoods and black people were not allowed to live in those neighborhoods, right? And that was legal. Um, and uh, one thing that was an outcome of the segregation laws and uh, redlining and segregation in schools is that many of people of color will have less access to quality public schools and private schools, uh, right? Because the schools we attend are based on the location that we live. Um, and if people are denied living in certain neighborhoods, then they won't have access to the schools in those neighborhoods, which they may be better schools or worse schools, right? Um, and oftentimes uh, this has led to schools in neighborhoods of color being of less quality, right? Um, the discrimination and the lack of quality public education has led to a poverty status. Um, and you see there's a double arrow there, right? It's a reinforcing thing, the poverty status and the education. Uh, because our education is based on our income, uh, right? It's based on property taxes uh, in the neighborhoods we live in. And so if you are a poverty status or you, maybe you don't own property, the taxes are gonna not be um, the same, right, in a wealthier neighborhood. Uh, so the money the school receive will be different than in a wealthier neighborhood. Um, and then we see this leading, if you don't have quality public schools, leading to um, more high school dropouts, uh, folks who only get a, a high school diploma and then don't go on to higher education, uh, right, which could then also lead back to that poverty status. So we see this as kind of a reinforcing cycle here. Um, another example is someone who is an undocumented immigrant or someone who has documentation and is an immigrant still face uh, historic and ongoing discrimination, uh, right, which could then lead into this poverty status, this cycle here. Um, and then if they are undocumented or a person of color, especially if they are both, uh, undocumented and a person of color, um, they may be profiled by the police, right? They're much more likely to be profiled by the police than uh, white people, right? And if someone's profiled by the police, that makes that person less safe and also have less access to services, right? So if someone does experience sexual violence, uh, but they don't feel safe to contact law enforcement um, or services that engage with law enforcement, they may have less access to some of those services. Um, you do not need to contact law enforcement to access services, uh, but some folks don't realize this. Um, and sometimes um, this can be um, a big way that many services receive referrals, right? Uh, then if someone is transgender, I have on here that they may face hiring and housing discrimination. Um, right, so uh, there was a recent Supreme Court decision saying that hiring discrimination is um, illegal. Uh, you cannot discriminate against someone who is trans or LGB um, in hiring. I left it on the slide because it was a very, very recent decision. Um, and that kind of discrimination doesn't just change overnight because now it's suddenly illegal. Um, there are still hiring discrimination that is alive and well. And um, the way that this is going to change over time remains to be seen, right? And then the housing discrimination, it is still legal in many parts of the country, including Arizona, many parts of Arizona, to um, have housing discrimination against transgender individuals. And then lastly, I have, uh, if someone's a woman, 
Uh, they're more likely to have a lower salary, which also leads into this poverty status. So we can see this is kind of a messy map and it's the reinforcing um, map. Um, so we can see that being part of one oppressed group could cause someone to join another oppressed group and reinforces their, impression, their oppression. So this brings us to intersectionality, right? So that, that map was very messy and it was messy for a reason, right? Because a lot of this is messy. Uh, but intersectionality is the way identities and systems of power such as race, class, and gender interact and influence oppression. Right, so what does this look like? So we have this person on the screen and we might make some, uh, some assumptions about this person's identity. I would caution you against making assumptions because we don't know how people identify until we ask them. Um, but someone may look at this person and make some assumptions. And now I created this slide so I know how this person identifies. Um, and so she identifies as a woman. Uh, and she identifies as black. And these two are things that people may assume about her based on her appearance. Uh, but she also has more identities um, beyond being a black woman, right? So um, she is straight, she's dyslexic, so she has a disability, and she's college educated, right? And so you can see from her different identities that she has some identities that are um, privileged identities, right? So being college educated, being straight. And then she also has identities that are oppressed identities. So being black, being a woman, being dyslexic, um, right? Are more oppressed identities. And I have this on the screen because our identities and um, like our membership to dominant or non-dominant social groups, it does not exist in a vacuum, right? We all hold multiple intersecting identities and we also have our own life experience as well, which shapes our identities many times. Um, we can hold multiple privileges and multiple oppressions at the same time. All right, so I'm gonna talk about uh, gender roles uh, and how they uh, influence and contribute to rape culture before we really get into um, what exactly rape culture is, right? It helps to understand gender first. So what does American culture say about gender, right? Um, so what does it mean to be a boy? What does it mean to be a girl? So on the screen here, I have a few different examples. Um, so on the teal blue color, I have what does it mean to be a boy? And so some examples we have are aggressive, independent, dominant, unemotional, right? Never cry. Uh, sexual, um, action-oriented, right? And then under what it means to be a woman, um, is we have the, the opposite, right? So being dependent, being weak, submissive, uh, being emotional, never thinking about sex, right? And um, when I give this presentation um, to an audience, uh, people almost always come up with uh, very similar lists um, and beyond, right? This is a very simplified list, uh, and there's a lot more um, things that our culture says about being a man or being a woman, right? Our culture also says there's only two genders, right? Which isn't true. Um, and sometimes I get pushback, right? Sometimes people will look at this list and they'll say, this is, this is true, this is what the culture says, but this isn't accurate, this is, the culture's changing, this is not what people are saying anymore, and this is changing. Right, and I would agree. I think it is changing slowly over time, uh, but it's not changing um, very fast or um, in a way that it would make it very difficult for people to come up with this list, right? And then I also pulled. I have these memes that I found um, from I think a Facebook friend of mine posted them just like last year, um, because I get a lot of pushback about um, how this is changing. And these memes say the difference between a big sister and a big brother, right? And you can see the big sister is holding the baby, being nurturing, right? And the big brother is pinching the baby's nose, so being aggressive, right? And so um, that is a meme about babies um, and toddlers interacting with each other. And so things aren't changing that much if we are still um, celebrating this kind of behavior um for girls 
and um, laughing about this kind of behavior for boys, right? Um, if, if things were changing, we would uh, not necessarily see memes like this. And then on the other meme, it says, I have three children, two I birthed, one I married. So it's um, a meme about how women are nurturing, home-oriented, and mothering, even to the adult man that they are married to, right? And then it's also letting the adult man off the hook for caring for the children as well. And like I said before, our culture also says that there are only two genders, right? We're socialized into these binary genders, being male or female. Um, and this is, this is pretty harmful. But uh, today when I'm talking about this, um, when I'm talking about masculinity, I'm talking about all the things that are associated with men and what it means to be a man. And with femininity, this is associated with women and what it means to be a woman. Um, and femininity and masculinity are all parts of our gender expression. And this will include the way we dress, the way we act, our body language, and more. Um, and the reason this is, this is harmful for a lot of different reasons, right? Because it, it, it partly gives us these strict roles of like what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. Um, and when these roles are um, violated in some kind of way, um, that, that can cause uh, violence to happen, right? The socialization can be harmful to people who identify as cisgender men, cisgender women, but it's also particularly harmful to those who identify as non-binary, those who are trans, uh, and those who are gender non-conforming, right? Um, and part of the harm that this causes is that non-binary genders in particular can be erased from the conversation. And then in today's training, we're really focused on what society as a whole says. So most of the examples we're gonna talk about are going to be those like really specific gender roles, cisgender uh, men, cisgender women. Um, but I really want to acknowledge that non-binary folks are often erased because of the way that our society talks about gender. And we will get into that a little bit more later. So what does it mean to be a boy um, in our society? Stop crying. Stop with the tears. Don't cry. Pick yourself up. Stop with the emotions. Don't be a pussy. Don't let nobody disrespect you. Be cool and be kind of a dick. Always keep your mind. Nobody likes a tattletale. Bros come before hoes. Don't let your woman run your you life. You bitch. What a fag. Get laid. Do something. Be a man. Be a man. Grow some balls. The three most destructive words that every man receives when he's a boy is when he's told to be a man. We've constructed an idea of masculinity in the United States that doesn't give young boys a way to feel secure in their masculinity. So we make them go prove it all the time. Within their peer group culture, each of them is posturing based on how the other boys are posturing. And what they end up missing is what they each really want, which is just that closeness. In good times, guys are like really close to each other. But when things get a little bit worse, you're on your own. From middle school, I had four really close friends. Once I kind of went into high school, I struggle finding people I can talk to because I feel like I'm not supposed to get help. Our kids get up every morning. They have to prepare their mask for how they're going to walk to school. A lot of our students don't know how to take the mask off. What is it you don't let people see? Almost 90% of you have pain and anger on the back of that paper. If you never cry, then you have all these feelings stuffed up inside of you, and then you can't get them out. They really buy into the, a culture that doesn't value what we've feminized. If we're in a culture that doesn't value caring, doesn't value relationships, doesn't value empathy, you are going to have boys and girls, men and women go crazy. I had anger issues in high school. I felt like an outcast. I've been suspended at least once every year I was here. We would just look for trouble and just like try to fight. Boys are more likely to act out. They're more likely to become aggressive. Most people miss that as depression or see it as a conduct disorder, or just a bad kid. I felt like just giving up on life. You know, I had suicide thoughts in my head at sixth grade. 
I felt alone for, for a long time. And I actually thought about killing myself. Whether it's homicidal violence or suicidal violence, people resort to such desperate behavior only when they are feeling shamed and humiliated or feel they would be if they didn't prove that they were real men. If you're told from day one, don't let nobody disrespect you, and this is the way you handle it as a man, respect is linked to violence. If I can man up, why step down from that, you feel me? It's like instinct. Like a man. Be a man. For my kids, I was going to end this hyper masculine narrative here. All right. So that um, was the trailer for The Mess You Live In, which is a really good documentary that takes a really good look at how. Um, the norms of what our society says it means to be a man are really harmful to men and boys and how that also can lead to men and boys um, committing violence, right? Um, and I think it's a really good um, example of how all of the um, things on the list uh, from before um, show up in other ways as well. Oops. All right, so typically I ask folks what you see in this photo. Um, and so I do want you all, if you're listening, to pause and think about this photo uh, for a minute. Um, some of the things that I see in this photo is I see three boys um, who are probably like, I don't know, five, six, um, so like eight, nine years of age playing, right? I see they all have some kind of weapon, right? They have toy swords, toy guns. Uh, one of them is dressed up as Batman, so they might be playing some kind of superhero game, um, that sort of thing, right? So uh, we see that um, boys, these boys are being taught to play at violence at a very young age, uh, right? Um, and it's very innocent, right? They are just playing, uh, but they are being taught to play at violence. Um, another thing I see is that all three boys are white, um, right? Well, how would this photo look different if these boys were not white? Uh, and I don't really even need to ask that question because we know um, that when black boys are playing with toy weapons, right, like Tamir Rice was, um, Tamir Rice was 12 years old playing with a toy gun and he was shot and killed by law enforcement, um, right? So uh, as we go through today's presentation, I want you to think about how things like race also will impact uh, how um, gender, uh, what it means to be a boy, what it means to be a man, uh, and what it means to be a girl, what it means to be a woman will be impacted, right? When we um, teach men and boys that violence is the acceptable way to deal with problems, uh, right, like we saw in the Man Up trailer, uh, like we see when we teach boys to play at violence, something that happens is that men and boys will grow up and use violence to solve their problems. Um, so I have two headlines here. One is from um, the Texas school shooting from a couple years ago. Uh, where the shooter, he went into the school and one of the first uh, people that he killed uh, was a girl who had been rejecting his advances for months, right, according to the mother, right? Uh, she would repeatedly reject um, his advances and it's thought that was one of the reasons that he uh, went into the school with a gun and started killing people. The other example is from a mall uh, it's actually the um, my childhood mall that I grew up near, um, and a woman was um, killed by the security guard. So um, the security guard had been sexually harassing her. She reported it. Uh, the security guard was fired, and then he came back to the mall and killed her. 
we also, when we're talking about what it means to be a boy and to grow up into a man, we see different types of um, initiations into manhood, right, as like different milestones to achieve um, throughout different parts of our culture. So we have the movie The 40 year old Virgin. Uh, there's a big emphasis uh, for men and boys to lose their virginity at younger ages uh, and to have sex and lots of sexual conquests. Uh, right, and the reason the 40 year old virgin is funny is because he's so old and hasn't had sex. Um, we also see hazing. So there's a photo um, in the middle of a fraternity hazing. Uh, this is from a TV show, so it's not a real photo. Um, but uh, oftentimes hazing can be, become sexualized very easily, right? In this photo, you see that the men uh, being hazed are like wearing diapers and um, otherwise they're naked and they're being forced to drink alcohol. Um, and so this could become sexualized very easily. And there's many different cases of hazing that involve sexual violence. Either the um, people being hazed are uh, being sexually violated in some way, or they are um, being forced to sexually harm someone else as part of the hazing ritual. We also see things like bachelor parties um, and how uh, bachelor parties have become this like sexualized event uh, where it's like your last night of freedom um, and it involves often getting a stripper, going to a strip club, uh, is seen as like the normal um, thing to do for your bachelor party. And it, it heavily involves the, the objectification of women. Another thing we see is that men are told to not be women, right? They are not allowed to act feminine in any way, right? And so we have Martin from The Simpsons on the screen uh, and the reason his character is funny is because he's a feminine boy right he's feminine and most of the jokes about him are because he is feminine that's what's funny um, and so that's a reflection of that cultural value uh, here we have some underwear that says don't be a pussy eat one um, and so that has both the effect of objectifying women in the photo and then also um, repeating that refrain of like, uh, don't be a pussy, take it like a man, th those sorts of things, don't be a woman, right? And then when it comes to things like sexual violence, if a man ever experiences sexual violence or any other kind of victimization, victimization is seen as emasculation, uh, right? Any kind of victimization, uh, you're seen as less than, less of a man because of it. Right. And so that's why um, there's memes out there that say things like, I heard you got beat up by a girl, uh, take it like a man, walk it off, suck it up, right? All of those things because emasculation is so feared. Um, so we talk about toxic masculinity pretty frequently. Um, and we've defined toxic masculinity on the screen here as when the qualities of masculinity become harmful to men and or harmful to others, right? So it's, it's not just that it's causing harm to other people, it's also causing harm to men and boys themselves, right? And so some of these qualities are suppressing your emotions, um, solving your problems with violence, those initiations into manhood, right? Like the loss of virginity um, and hazing, not being emasculated at any cost, uh, and then those objectification, sexual objectification of women and predatory behaviors being approved, right? And so we saw a few examples, but we'll get into more examples of that as we go. And then ultimately, toxic masculinity tells someone, tells a man to never be a victim, right? No matter what. So what does that mean for male survivors, right? So what, what does toxic masculinity mean for a man or a boy who's a survivor of sexual violence. Oftentimes, this means that it's harder to come forward, it's harder to disclose that anything happened. We see um, there's different studies that show that um, the rates that we have um, of men experiencing sexual violence are quite high that we went, we went through at the beginning, but it's also even more likely that men are not telling 
uh, anonymous surveys that they've experienced sexual violence, right? So the, the number is thought to be even higher than it is. Um, men are less likely to seek services after experiencing sexual violence as well uh, because toxic masculinity tells them they need to take it like a man, right? Um, and so we want to start thinking about this. Um, and if we work with survivors, we want to think about this. If we care about sexual violence survivors, we want to think about this because there's all kinds of work that we can do to um, make ourselves safer spaces for men who experience sexual violence. So um, now that we've gone through what it means to be a boy, what does it mean to be a girl? So these images you may recognize. Um, so we have toddlers and tiaras, uh, the TV show. Uh, we have dance moms on here. And all of these young girls, excuse me, they look um, maybe like three, uh, maybe six or seven at the oldest, being very, very sexualized, um, right? Um, showing a lot of skin, wearing a lot of makeup and put it, being put in these very sexual um, outfits, uh, right? So girls are taught to be sexual from a very young age. Um, as girls grow into teenagers, we see things like this. So um, there was a magazine um, that the title on the magazine was Why TV is Sexier Than Ever. And they include a list of adults and Millie Bobby Brown. So Millie Bobby Brown, the girl pictured here, if you don't know, is um, one of the children in Stranger Things. She's the main character uh, in Stranger Things. And uh, at the time of this magazine, she was 12 years old, right? And she was already being sexualized um, in the media. And the gift we see uh, is from Pretty Little Liars. So Pretty Little Liars, is uh, a TV show that was targeted to teens, had a very large teen audience. And the girl uh, is a student and her boyfriend is the teacher, right? And this is actually portrayed as one of the healthiest and positive relationships throughout the entire show, uh, right? And I think she was 14, if I recall, when they met and started dating. Um, and then lastly, we have this comic book uh, Invincible Iron Man. Um, the, the girl here, her name is Riri Williams. Um, she is the new Ironheart um, Iron Man character. Um, and this was the first art of her that was released. And she, her character is supposed to be 15 years old. Um, and there was actually such backlash to this um, that they eventually changed her um, look and her outfit. So uh, girls are taught to be sexual from a very young age, which can lead to unhealthy sexualization. So this is when a person's value is determined only or primarily by sexual appeal or behavior to the exclusion of other characteristics, right? It doesn't matter if someone's smart, uh, what matters is that someone is sexy, right? And this continues on into adulthood and there's lots of examples of sexual objectification. So we see here we have American Apparel. Uh, American Apparel is one of the worst offenders of sexual objectification. It's very easy to find examples um, from their advertisements. Uh, we have uh, Sports Illustrated. So Sports Illustrated very rarely has women on the cover unless it's the swimsuit edition, right? And this is also tied into this idea of being like a perfect 10, right? And then we also have candies at Kohl's. So this commercial, candies is a um, teen, tween, like juniors line at Kohl's. Um, and this uh, image that we see is pretty sexualized and it's for like a tween audience. So sexual, objectif sexual objectification is when a person is made uh, into a tool for other sexual use and pleasure rather than treated as a person with the capacity for independent thought and action. And we, sex we see sexual objectification all the time. Oops. So I have this um, Hardy's commercial um, as an example of this sexual objectification. 
I love going all natural. It just makes me feel better. Nothing between me and my 100% all natural, juicy, grass fed beef. Introducing the All Natural Burger, the first ever in fast food, with no antibiotics, no added hormones, and no steroids. Only at Hardee's. So in that commercial, we see a lot of uh, examples of objectification, right? So she is thought to be walking through the farmer's market completely naked. Um, the male characters grab different types of fruit that are meant to represent her body in different ways. Uh, and there's a lot of um, sexualized imagery just in general. All uh, right, so um, nothing about eating a burger is sexual. So why is there the sexual objectification happening? We also see sexual objectification in um, all forms of music, uh, as well as things in our everyday life. Um, so in music, um, I will often ask people what they think is the genre with the most objectification. They always get it wrong. Uh, the number one is actually blues, number two is country, uh, and number three is rap uh, music. So uh, everyone always gets that one wrong, but it's prevalent in every single genre of music, right? And it's really, really easy to find um, by looking pretty much at any music video. In our everyday life, we see this uh, like ketchup bottle. So this ketchup bottle says bottoms up keep my bottom up and I'll be ready when you are, right? This is just like at a restaurant, a sports bar, um, and it's on the table, right? It's, there's, uh, it's hard to escape the sexual objectification. Uh, we also see that gender role socialization and the media teaches boys and girls what's expected in heterosexual relationships, right? So all the, um, these gender roles and the media is all teaching us what it means to be a boy, what it means to be a girl, and then it's also teaching us what it means to be a boy or girl in a relationship. And almost all the examples are heterosexual relationships. So we see um, this image, it says John's bitch, and then there's another that says property of Mike, that's from a swap meet, um, and that is indicating that the person wearing um, those items of clothing are uh, owned uh, by these men, uh, right? So that women are objects to be owned. And then we also see a trophy wife uh, t-shirt, right? So this woman's wearing a t-shirt, it says trophy. Um, and I want you to think to yourselves, what, who is a trophy wife? What does that mean? Who's a trophy wife and who has trophy wives, right? So most of the time, a trophy wife is someone who is younger, blonde, uh, right, uh, has uh, like a perfect body, right, they might be a model, uh, and then a person who has a trophy wife is an older white man uh, who is rich, right, these are the typical answers I get when I ask this question. So now we're going to watch a clip from The Notebook, uh, which is a romantic comedy, um, between um, the main characters, uh, Noah and, um, now I'm blanking on the girl's name, uh, but you'll see in the clip. Um, but at this point, Noah has already asked the girl out, uh, I think at least once or twice, and then he's going to ask her out again in this clip. I'm Noah Calhoun. So? So it's really nice to Allie. meet you. 
Who is this guy? I don't know. No Calhoun. I would really like to take you out. Fred, do you mind? <laughs> you can't sit more than two people in a chair, no one! Okay, Tommy, all right. Get down, no! You're gonna kill yourself! No, cut it out! Well, will you go out me? What? No! No? No! No. Hey, pal, she just told you. Why not? I don't know, because I don't want to. Ella! All right, well, you leave me no other choice then. Ah! Oh, my God! I'm the king! No, stop going around! What are you doing? Oh, I grabbed the ball. I'm going to ask you one more time. Will you? Or will you not go out with me? <laughs> God damn, my head's slipping. You grabbed the ball, you idiot! Not until she agrees. Oh, uh, go out with him, honey. Okay, okay, fine. I'll go out with you. Well, don't do me any favors. No, no, I want to. You want to. Yes! You want to. Say it. I want to go out with you. Say it again. I want to go out with you. All right, all right, we'll go out. You think you're so smart, don't you? That was a funny <laughs> no, you idiot. Oh, it's okay. I'll take care of this. All right. So we see in this clip um, that Noah pressures Allie into going out with him, right? He coerces her. He repeatedly asks her after she says no. Um, and then when she continues to say no, he threatens to harm himself. Um, and so all of these are tactics of coercion. And what this kind of um, movie is teaching people is that this is romantic and this is acceptable behavior. Uh, when what it's really teaching people is that no doesn't mean no, it means convince me. So now that we've gone through some of the um, broad gender roles that exist in um, US society, uh, we wanna take a deeper look at um, what gender roles mean for different identity groups. Um, and we see that there is a strong connection between gender and race. Uh, especially with whiteness, right? So gender roles have been used uh, throughout history to reinforce racism and colonialism, right? Most gender roles that exist are for white women, right? And that's like the epitome of being a woman is to be a white woman. And then all other women who are not white um, are expected to be in line with those gender roles. Right, uh, And when people who are not white violate these gender stereotypes or transgress against these gender stereotypes, this is often considered even worse uh, by mainstream society than when white women and men um, violate or transgress against these gender roles. So um, in the history of the world, we had uh, a colonial era where Europe uh, colonized uh, the Americas, Africa, and many parts of Asia, uh, right? And there's very few areas of the world that are untouched by this colonial era. And during the colonial era, the Europeans developed the slave trade and they used many different oppressive tactics against indigenous populations, um, such as sexual stereotypes and sexual violence that continue to affect many populations today. Right, so the Europeans created these stereotypes to justify um, their behavior um, and justify what they were doing um, to people of color during this time. And this led over time to sexual fetishization um, of these different groups and hypersexualization of these different groups, which leads to sexual violence, right? All of these stereotypes continue today and lead to sexual violence. So uh, we see this example um, is uh, with black women and stereotypes about black women. So the image on the left here is an image of a woman named Sarah Bartman. Uh, she, was, she is from uh, what's now known as South Africa and she was paraded around Europe as a freak uh, because of the shape of her body, right? Uh, especially the way that her bottom is emphasized uh, in the artwork uh, that you see here. Um, this was emphasized as she was par paraded around Europe, right? And this is still a stereotype and a part of Black women uh, that is very sexualized today. 
uh, and we see this in the example here. Um, so we see uh, first the photo of a naked black woman holding champagne um, on her bottom. Uh, and this image is actually from the 1980s. It's from a book called Jungle Fever, which is um, the name of like the fetishizing black women. Um, people say they'll have jungle fever if they fetishize black women. Uh, and then we also see Kim Kardashian, who is not black, uh, recreating this image um, just a couple years ago. And she did this uh, to quote unquote, break the internet. And you can see the differences between these photos. It's still set up very similarly, but she's allowed to be clothed and to be covered in her jewels, uh, right? And to have that dignity, right? Where the black woman is not. Um, and then we also see these other stereotypes that have come out uh, from the slavery uh, era, the colonial era uh, and Jim Crow. Right, so we have the Jezebel stereotype. The Jezebel stereotype says that black women are hypersexual. They're always up for sex. And if someone is stereotyped as being hypersexual, that means that they are always consenting and they cannot be raped, right? Obviously that's not true, uh, but this is a very um, significant stereotype about black women. The next stereotype we have is the sapphire stereotype. Um, this is the angry or sassy black woman stereotype. Um, so this basically is used to discount black women's justifiable anger um, and to minimize their emotions in general, right? So uh, maybe a survivor, uh, a black survivor of sexual violence is being stereotyped as being an angry black woman because she's justifiably upset about what happened to her. And then the other stereotype I wanna talk about is the mammy stereotype or the matriarch stereotype. So the, the mammy stereotype is that caretaker, that nurturer stereotype, um, and that has very much come out of the uh, slave and post-slavery times in this country of black women caring for white uh, babies and children. Um, and the mammy stereotype is um, stereotypes black women as being asexual, uh, being undesirable, and uh, being unable to experience trauma. As I said, this has kind of morphed over time as well into the matriarch stereotype, which is that strong black woman uh, who is the primary breadwinner, primary caretaker of her family, and she is also not allowed uh, to feel emotions because she's too busy being strong all of the time. She's not allowed to be vulnerable. We also see um, stereotypes that affect Black men. Um, in particular, the one I want to emphasize today is that um, the colonial slave and Jim Crow histories created this stereotype that Black men were specifically attracted to white women and they would rape white women, right? And this was used in history to justify lynching black men um, after the end of the Civil War. Um, and we see this, so uh, this is a propaganda um, of uh, this from back in the um, colonial or the um, post-Civil War time, right? Um, we see this, um, this imagery. And then today, um, this Vogue, um, I believe it was like 2008 maybe, this Vogue cover shoot of LeBron uh, and Giselle. Um, and the way that they are positioned in the Vogue shoot is very, very similar to the way that many propaganda images portrayed this stereotype uh, back when uh, it was the Jim Crow and post-Civil War time. When it comes to East Asian women, we see a number of stereotypes. Um, and so the images we have here is, this, the one on the left is from Madame Butterfly. Uh, Madame Butterfly is an opera that's still performed to this day, and it's based on a book called Madame Chrysanthemum. Madame Chrysanthemum is a book that was written in the 1800s by a French man. And it is the origin of almost every single stereotype about East Asian women, right? And it's like I said, 
still performed to this day. Uh, it's also been adapted into um, uh, the movie Miss Saigon. So Miss Saigon, which is a movie that's frequently recreated and is also a play, um, is based almost entirely on the plot of Madame Butterfly uh, and is where a lot of um, East Asian stereotypes remain perpetuated. Uh, so the phrase, me love you long time, comes from that movie. Um, the, uh, the stereotypes I have listed here um, are really emphasizing how East Asian women are fetishized. Um, so we have geisha girls, China doll, lotus, blo lotus blossoms um, as different things that East Asian women have been called. And essentially here what they are being stereotyped is, as is being exotic, uh, right? At the same time, they are stereotyped as being submissive and childlike, while also being hypersexual and always up for it, right? So they're being stereotyped as submissive and childlike and hypersexual um, at the same time. And then East Asian women are also subject to the model minority myth, which is essentially this idea that East Asians are a better minority than other types of minorities, which is completely ridiculous, uh, but is definitely a stereotype that East Asian people face. Uh, and what this leads to is that when East Asian folks experience sexual violence, uh, they're less likely to come forward, less likely to disclose or tell anyone about what they've experienced because of this myth. Uh, means that they're not supposed to experience that sort of thing. They're supposed to be better than that, uh, right? When it comes to East Asian men, there's um, some different stereotypes uh, that we don't see for other people of color. Um, so East Asian men are actually uh, stereotyped to be feminine and emasculated, uh, right? And so they actually face different sexualized stereotypes. Um, and this has its roots in history. So uh, back uh, several, um, like a hundred years ago, um, the East Asian men were not allowed to own property um, and they weren't allowed to work in the heavy industries, right? So basically all the jobs uh, that back in the day were stereotyped as like masculine jobs, they were not allowed to have. This forced them to take on uh, jobs that were considered fam uh, that were considered feminine, uh, right? Like cooking or laundry, and this contributed to this idea that uh, East Asian men uh, were feminine. Uh, at the time, it was also illegal for Asian men to marry white women, right? So miscegenation uh, laws, uh, not being able to have interracial marriage, and then. We also saw that if non-white women, so non-white um, and non-Asian women, if they married Asian men, they risked losing their citizenship as well, right? So all of this contributed to Asian men being seen as feminine. And so this has translated into modern day stereotypes that continue to perpetuate this idea that Asian men are, are um, feminine uh, and also that they have small penises. Uh, when it comes to the native and indigenous population, we see a lot of stereotypes as well. Um, so the image on the left is an, a propaganda image uh, from uh, the time of Christopher Columbus um, that was used to encourage people to to encourage Europeans to come to the United uh, to come to what's now known as the United States. Um, and the uh, land and the women in these propaganda images were portrayed as ripe for the taking, right? They were always portrayed as being nude um, and being sexually available to the Europeans. Uh, in the present day, we see people um, using traditional regalia as costumes. Um, in this example, we see a Victoria's Secret fashion show um, using this, uh, it's very, very disrespectful. And then they're also sexualizing it in this example. Um, over time in the history of this country, uh, 
the indigenous populations were forced to assimilate um, to United States laws, and they were also forced to lose their jurisdiction right over their territory. Uh, they are not allowed to prosecute sexual violence when it's perpetrated by a non-native on their um, land. Uh, and then we also see stereotypes like the Indian princess, uh, right, things like, like Pocahontas, stereotypes um, about native women as well. When it comes to native men, um, we also see a lot of uh, stereotypes. And again, similar to black men, the stereotypes about killing and raping white women uh, were very common. Um, so the, the image on the left, the painting, is a painting of a woman uh, who died in 1777 um, while she was traveling, right? No one knows why or how they died. Um, and the painting is based on a legend uh, that blamed Native men who killed her. So none of this is true. It's completely made up, um, right? And then we see um, an image of the Declaration of Independence, right? So one of our founding documents as a country um, specifically refers to Native men as savages, which is considered a slur. Um, against Native people. Um, and again, we see that slur being used in Pocahontas, uh, which is a much more recent example um, and a very influential um, example. Uh, finally, uh, we also want to look at the stereotypes um, affecting Latinos. Um, so when it comes to Latino women, um, we see the stereotypes again are rooted in that history. So most of the stereotypes about Latina women come from uh, Lupe Vélez. So Lupe Vélez was an actress. She was the first Mexican actress to make it big in Hollywood um, in the early 1900s. And a lot of these stereotypes about Latinas are based on her specific personality. Uh, right, because she was considered to be like a firecracker kind of personality. Um, and all of the stereotypes listed like hot, spicy, fiery, uh, and passionate, hypersexual were actually based on her. Um, some of them were also based on Carmen Miranda. Carmen Miranda is a Brazilian singer from the 1930s who was also very sexualized uh, and very, very popular in the US. Uh, we see these stereotypes perpetuated today in shows like Modern Family, um, where um, uh, Sofia Vigara's character is extremely sexualized um, very frequently. Um, and we also see it in Desperate Housewives. Um, so again, uh, Latino women are also considered hypersexual. And like I mentioned before, for all of the stereotypes that um, are about being hypersexual. If someone's stereotyped as hypersexual, that means that they're stereotyped as being unrapeable, right? They're not able to be sexually assaulted according to these stereotypes, which is untrue. So now we have another video to watch. He was always checking up on my friend's Facebook. I just don't think I could ever date a Latino. Why? They're so passionate though. Yeah, I heard they're the best in bed. No, they're like super aggressive and sexist. Jenny, that's just how Latino men are though. Wow, that's a generalization. Uh, who invited her? This is the cat call, and I'm calling this shit out. Where do we get the idea that Latino men are innately machista? You can thank the media for stereotyping Latino men as aggressive criminals and lovers. In the 1990s, films like Tony the Greaser, Bronco Billy and the Greaser, and The Greaser's Revenge introduced a Mexican trope known as the bandito, an outlaw an aggressive and violent character. Today, the bandito trope can be seen as plain old criminals, drug lords, and gangsters. Hey, finally, oh. up, best hit. Let me get his money first. We then have the Latin lover trope. He's romantic. He has a passionate temperament. He's a ladies' man. And of course, he's highly sexual. Ooh la la. 
Although the original Latin lover trope was aimed at Mediterranean men like Italian star Rudolf Valentino, it slowly morphed to be synonymous with Latino men, like in the film Latin Lovers, where a white woman travels to Brazil and meets Roberto Santos. Or in the film The Kissing Bandit, where Frank Sinatra plays the son of a Mexican bandit. Yeah, Frank Sinatra plays Mexican, but we'll keep that for another episode. We've seen the Latin lover trope in characters like Zorro, Ricky Ricardo, Gomez Adams, and even some cartoon characters. Venga conmigo, señorita. Le enseñaré las maravillas de la galaxia, y juntos, con nuestro amor, venceremos al mal. So, are Latino men the only people to be womanizers? To be extremely aggressive? To be overtly sexual? No, of course not. But they've been stereotyped as innately machista, particularly in comparison to white men. Wait, hold on a second. I have seen white guys portray aggressive macho roles too. Well, while Leo DiCaprio can play a sex-addicted, money-hungry womanizer in one movie, there's like 20 other movies where he isn't. Meanwhile, Danny Trejo has basically made a career out of playing a sexual violent criminal. So what? Like, what's the big deal? It's TV. It's for fun. Well, the media has always played a big role in influencing public opinion. And these over-the-top sexual and aggressive messages of Latino men influence how teachers view Latino boys, how the police interact with Latino men, or how employers view Latino applicants. No one is free of internalizing these messages. But the good thing is, is that once you're made aware of these messages, it makes it easier to break them down. All right, so being a chauvinist machista isn't a cultural thing. Actually, it is. Because chauvinism and machista culture is part of all of our cultures because we live in a male-dominated society. Oh my god, so I should, what, I should stay away from all men? Right? Well, no, but what you should do is judge people on an individual basis and not group them together based on cultural background. By doing that, you may miss out on someone pretty special. You gonna eat that? Here's a check, ladies. Oh, okay. got it, got it. Oh, you're leaving? Thanks, girl. Okay, I got it. When's the next brunch? Damn! What are other examples of machismo in the media that come to mind? So we see in that video that um, she goes through a lot of the different stereotypes that Latino men face uh, that are similar uh, to those violent stereotypes that other men of color face as well. We also want to look at how stereotypes affect other populations, so uh, for the LGBTQ community. So we see um, the stereotypes in this community is that uh, gender, uh, binary genders are preferred uh, and non-binary genders are completely erased, like I mentioned at the beginning of today's presentation. Uh, right, so this um, can lead, this is something that we see outside the community and as well as inside the community. Uh, we also see a lot of sexual objectification and fetishization. Um, we see this especially for uh, lesbian and bisexual women. Um, and when we see this for lesbian, bisexual women, I want to remind us that um, those groups experience the highest rates of sexual violence, right? Bisexual women experience 75% um, 75 uh, 75 of bisexual women have experienced some form of sexual violence in their lifetime. That's the highest rate um, among anyone in the LGBTQ community. Um, and one of the reasons that this is thought to happen is because of that significant fetishization of bisexual women and lesbians. We also see sexual objectification of gay men uh, in advertisements in particular uh, that are advertising to gay men. Um, we see stereotypes of hypersexuality, so I feel like every member of the LGBTQ community is uh, frequently stereotyped as being hypersexual. So bisexuals uh, are especially seen as hypersexual, but uh, many gay men are also seen as hypersexual as well as trans women in particular are seen as hypersexual. Uh, and so this, like I said before, hypersexuality uh, stereotypes are very impactful in terms of whether or not people believe someone can consent or not. Uh, pedophilia uh, stereotypes is very, very um, significant um, as a stereotype of the LGBTQ community. So um, I think a year ago now, um, the former Pope of the Catholic Church wrote a letter about why um, sexual violence and pedophilia were happening in the Catholic Church. And in his letter, he said it was because of gay men 
right? And there's this persisting stereotype that gay men in particular are more likely to be pedophiles because they're trying to convert young boys into turning into uh, being gay, right? Which is not true. Pedophilia and being a member of the LGBTQ community are completely separate things. Um, and pedophilia is not tolerated, right? Uh, and then finally, we also see that racism, sexism, transphobia, and biphobia also exist within the LGBTQ community as well, right? So again, being a member of one oppressed group does not make you immune to your other privileges. It does not make you less of a racist um, or a sexist person, uh, right? Those are still things that someone can be, uh, even if they hold an oppressed identity. All right. Uh, I also want to talk about people with disabilities and the sexual stereotypes that they experience. Um, so a very common um, stereotype is that they are asexual uh, and that they should not have sex. Um, and this, I think, comes from a um, lack of understanding about what sexual sexuality is. Right, because people, of course, can be asexual, right? That's an LGBTQ identity. Um, but just because someone has a disability doesn't mean that they are asexual and that they shouldn't even be having sex, right? We also see people with disabilities being portrayed as sexually deviant, right? Um, or harmful to others. Um, in particular, in the deaf community, uh, there's a stereotype that people who are deaf are uh, voyeurs or peeping toms. We also have these ideas that people with disabilities need to be isolated uh, from people who do not have disabilities and that they should never receive sex education, right? Because of the idea that they're asexual and they shouldn't be having sex anyway. Um, People with disabilities are viewed often as undesirable, um, which um, someone having a disability does not make them sexually undesirable, right? Uh, that is uh, unique to individuals, whether or not they are attracted to someone, right? It doesn't matter if someone has a disability. There's also these ideas that people with disabilities should be cured and they should want to be cured. And there's actually many disabilities where um, folks view it as part of their identity and they don't view it as a disability or as something that should be cured. So I think in particular in the deaf community and the autistic community, this is not necessarily something that those communities want uh, or are looking for. Uh, we also see that people with disabilities are pitied, uh, right, because of their disability or because they can't have sex in a particular way, right? All of these different things. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to talk about fetishization because there are people, um, they call themselves devotees uh, that fetishize people with disabilities. Um, and when you fetishize an entire identity, like we discussed with some of the other identities we went over, this can lead to a lot of problems and can lead to sexual violence, uh, right? So people um, who fetishize people with disabilities, they're often fetishizing physical disabilities as well. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that was mentioned um, so that we are aware that that fetishization also is taking place. So these norms and stereotypes that we've just gone through, so all those gender norms, all those uh, norms about race uh, that intersect with different um, genders and sexuality. Uh, all of these norms uphold oppression in our society, right? Like they help oppression to continue working. And so I want you to think about what happens when these norms are violated. Um, what happens uh, when people believe these stereotypes? And I know I've talked about some different examples of things that can happen. Um, but ultimately what happens is violence, right? People experience violence because these norms are violated or not upheld, right? And when people believe the stereotypes, that can further cause violence, right? Because either they're causing violence against people 
or they are believing the stereotypes. And so when someone experiences violence, they don't believe them um, or they don't think it's a big deal. And this leads us into rape culture, right? So all of those stereotypes are really very influential in rape culture and influence how different populations experience rape culture. So what is rape culture? Rape culture um, is the social, cultural, and structural discourses and practices in which sexual violence is tolerated, accepted, minimized, and trivialized, right? So basically rape culture is all the ways that our society and our culture make sexual violence normal, right? It normalizes sexual violence uh, in a way that makes it very difficult to recognize uh, because it's considered so normal uh, and just like a part of life. Uh, this is not to say that um, sexual violence is not illegal um, because of course it still is. But so it's a way that our culture makes it seem like it's not a big deal. So we have another video. Let's try that again. So I was walking home the other day and this guy followed me as I was walking to my apartment. He asked me where I was going and I said home, smiling politely and quickly turning around. Then he asked me if he could come with me and I said, no, I'm okay, this time making sure that I had no eye contact with him. Then he asked me, can I get your number? And I said, sorry, no thank you. Then he asked me, do you live alone? And I said, no, I live with my boyfriend, hoping that he would get the clue. Then he said, so can I get your number? Rape culture is a culture in which sexual violence is considered the norm. It's a culture where girls going away to college are told that they should invest in pepper spray keychains, but doesn't teach boys about consent. It's a culture that tells women that the length of their skirt determines how truthful their claims of sexual violence are. It's a culture that encourages women to keep their sexual assaults to themselves for fear of losing family members or ruining a reputation. It's a culture that tells boys that when they're raped by a female teacher, that they should be thankful that they were able to land a hot chick at such a young age. It's a culture that tells boys that they can't come forward about their rapes when their rapists are men, because surviving sexual violence makes you gay, and not being able to defend yourself makes you a wimp. It's a culture that jokes freely about men getting what they deserve in prison from other inmates. It's a culture that teaches men that they're incapable of being survivors of sexual violence because of physiological responses. It's a culture that teaches men that street harassment is a favorable way of approaching a woman. It's a culture where I have to say no over and over and over again because men are taught that no secretly means yes. It's a culture where men are more willing to respect my rejection if they believe that I belong to another man. Rape culture is not the idea that we live in a society that supports the idea of rape, but rather that we live in a society that trivializes, downplays, and sometimes struggles to decipher sexual violence. Rape culture tells survivors of sexual violence that they are required to report their rapes, but only convicts 2% of reported rapists. Rape culture unfortunately encourages silence. It creates a situation where people are made to feel responsible for the sexual violence that happens to them but very rarely prosecutes people who commit it. Rape culture is a social bias that we can deconstruct, and I'm happy that we're starting to have these conversations more and more. Anyway, this is all food for thought. I want you guys to always remember and to never forget that you are beautiful and you are loved. Bye. If you like this video, So I think Kat has a really uh, useful description of what rape culture is. And I know sometimes when I give this presentation, sometimes I get pushback that it doesn't exist, right? Rape culture doesn't exist. And we also see that in the media where the media has different articles about rape culture not existing. 
And like Kat mentioned, it's not about whether or not sexual violence is illegal. It's about how sexual violence is downplayed and minimized. Um, right, so we're going to get into some examples of what rape culture looks like. And so I know at the beginning, I gave a trigger warning for the training. Um, this is the section that um, I also want to get just another trigger warning for uh, of some of the images that we may see. So what are some examples of rape culture? So this is a, a t-shirt. Uh, and it says, it's not rape, it's a snuggle with a struggle, right? So it's really minimizing sexual violence. In this example, it says, this person, the person wearing this t-shirt is a police officer. Lie flat on your back and do everything the nice police officer tells you to do, right? So one, uh, what if a police officer is actually the person wearing the shirt, right? Um, or what if the person um, interacting with the person wearing the shirt believes that this person's a police officer, right? What are they supposed to do? Um, and then two, it also downplays that sexual misconduct among police officers is the second highest form of police violence, right? So I know police violence has been very prominently discussed um, in the news this year. Um, but sexual violence is the second most common form of police violence. And not a lot of people know that. And this shirt is really uh, making fun of that kind of violence. This shirt says, dead girls say no. Um, and this was actually taken uh, by someone that we know at the coalition. Uh, this image is a, um, truck uh, with a decal on it and the decal is a, a woman being um, kidnapped uh, she's tied up and the the company that made this decal well there's there's a few different companies that make this decal one of them made it to demonstrate how good their decals are like how realistic they could be and they chose this image right and so when we're talking about rape culture we're talking about all of the different ways that that image needs to go through, uh, right? So someone has come up with that idea, then it has to go through like different marketing teams, right? To make sure it's a good idea. And all of those teams said yes um, to this image that is clearly uh, very offensive and nobody had a problem with it. That's what rape culture is. The fact that nobody had a problem with it and that they publicly went forward with um, this decal. Um, and then this photo itself was actually taken by someone who works at the coalition while they were hiking, right? And if I saw this, this car while I was hiking, I would be very concerned for my own safety. Uh, we also see different costumes that people have. Um, so we see there's a man dressed up as like a flasher, and I've actually seen this costume in real life. Uh, we actually censored the costume. The website selling it does not censor it, uh, but we censored it for the training. And I actually, I attended a Take Back the Night event, which is an annual event um, raising awareness about sexual violence. And I went to this event and someone was protesting the event dressed up as a rapist, right? Um, so that uh, was very triggering for people at the event. There were many survivors at the event who were triggered um, and is um, rape culture is the fact that someone would even do something like that, right? Uh, we also see uh, women uh, dressed up for Halloween as rape victims. Uh, right, so they are making fun of uh, survivors as well. So it's not just men who are doing this. Uh, and then the, the big image here is a man dressed up as a prescription for Rohypnol, uh, also known as Rufies, uh, which is uh, a known date rape drug. Uh, and the instructions say, give two tablets to attractive, unaware girl, await drooling, drowsiness, or unconsciousness take home, bring friends, enjoy show. So rape culture is 
the fact that this man um, and those girls feel comfortable and think it's funny to dress up in these ways, but people who experience sexual violence don't feel comfortable to tell anyone about what's happened to them. We also see different themed parties um, that um, involve rape culture. Um, so one party that's like a pretty common college party is um, CEOs and office hoes as like a themed party. And so in that, the men dress up as CEOs and the women dress up as office hoes, right? And we have this image from Instagram of um, people uh, engaging in that party. Uh, so if someone goes to this party and they are sexually assaulted, um, do, you think, do you think folks will believe that that happened to them? Oftentimes they don't. We also see this, this kind of theme being recreated in any kind of way that you can rhyme hose, basically. So there's like toga bros um, and um, this, this other example we have on the screen is particularly bad because it's colonial bros and Navajos, right? So it's making fun of the genocide that happened in this country and the fact that indigenous women experience the highest rates of sexual violence of any ethnic group. Um, and it also uses slurs in the way they describe um, their um, party. Uh, we see uh, rape culture in music, uh, right, in lyrics and in music videos. So I think this is possibly one of the most famous modern examples of rape culture in music, uh, Blurred Lines by Robin Thicke. Uh, and the whole point of the song is that the lines are blurred and he can't tell if um, she wants him or not, but he says, I know you want it, right, and I hate these blurred lines. So if the line is blurry, that is not consent, right? Uh, if the line is blurry, we need to ask for clarification uh, before uh, doing anything sexual. Another example is this song from The Weeknd. Um, and this song in particular is about sexual violence against bisexual women. Um, so the lyrics talk about how you said you might be into girls, um, and I will fuck you straight, uh, which is a very common reason um, that violence is committed against the LGBTQ community um, and trying to make someone straight. We also see a number of examples of sexual violence and rape culture against men. Um, so not all of rape culture is about women, it's also about men. And we, we see this particularly in jokes about prison rape. I think prison rape is still considered an okay subject to joke about. Like people who know what I do for a living uh, will make prison rape jokes in front of me and think that I think I will think it's funny, right? Which I don't, it's not funny. Um, and oftentimes we make um, these jokes around people who have um, committed sexual harm, right? So we see this image of Jared, uh, Subway Jared, who um, was caught with child pornography. Um, and the New York Post says, enjoy a foot long in jail. So alluding to the fact that he, he will be sexually assaulted in jail. Uh, we see Aaron Hernandez, who was in prison for murder, and he actually later killed himself. Um, the image says goes to jail a tight end, leaves jail a wide receiver, right? So implying that he will be sexually assaulted in jail. Um, and he was put, he was in prison for murder. Um, and it was a very tragic case as well because after he died, they were like, it looks like he had some pretty severe traumatic brain injury, which potentially explains some of his behavior um, because of his injuries from football. Right. We see this joke about Justin Bieber. Um, and one thing I want to point out with the Justin Bieber joke is oftentimes when we see jokes about prison rape, the person who is joked to be the rapist is almost always a black man. 
right? So that ties into those stereotypes we were talking before about black men being rapists. This is the like, very, very common in prison rape jokes as well. We also see a lot of jokes about men, uh, particularly boys, being initiated into sex by an older woman, right? And that this is overwhelmingly seen as positive. Um, and so on the example here, we have Phoebe's brother from Friends and his teacher. Um, and this, uh, the joke was about their relationship, him being a student, her being a teacher. And they go on and have triplets and they're happily married. And it reinforces this idea that men and boys can't be raped because they always want they always want to have this initiation into sex by this older woman. They always are up for it. They always want that. And then we also need to keep in mind that at the beginning, we talked about culture and how uh, we're talking mostly about mainstream culture today, but many cultures have their own subculture. Uh, when we're talking about oppressed communities, oftentimes oppressed communities also have their own version of rape culture in addition to the mainstream rape culture that we experience in the United States. And in many cases, this can lead to even more silence around sex and sexual violence. It can lead to silence around reporting or seeking services. Um, it can also lead to keep it in the family attitudes, as well as community support for the perpetrator, right? And so like a, a pretty famous example of this community support of the perpetrator is R. Kelly, right? If you watch the documentary uh, about R. Kelly and sexual violence that um, you can see that it was like fairly widely known that this was happening, uh, but because it was happening um, to someone in, a community where the men are stereotyped as being uh, rapists, that there was reluctance to um, not continue to support him. Uh, Bill Cosby, I think, is another pretty famous example of that. All right, now we're going to look at how rape culture uh, intersects with pornography. Uh, and before I do this section, I want to talk about uh, how we uh, at the coalition, we are not anti-pornography. Uh, we think pornography um, can be a really great way to explore your sexuality, um, but we also want to caveat that it, it's best to do it in a healthy way, right, and to seek out healthy and ethically made pornography. But we also can't ignore that pornography contributes uh, to rape culture. So, um, I'm going to talk to, on this slide about mainstream pornography. So this is that free, internet-based, very easily accessible pornography. It's male-dominated, male-centric, and has themes of non-reciprocal sex. Uh, and this is like the easiest kind of pornography to find on the internet, right? And unfortunately, because we don't have very strong sex education in this country, this is where a lot of people learn about sex. Um, and so studies have found that the more frequently men watch pornography, the more likely they are to have sexist beliefs to endorse rapeness, engage in coercive or aggressive sexual behavior, and blame rape victims, right? So there is a lot of influence that this mainstream pornography has. Uh, when it comes to um, best-selling pornography, so this is pornography that needs to be purchased. Um, and this is like a best-selling pornography based on this study. Um, they did a content analysis uh, and found that 88% of scenes in best-selling pornography include some form of physical aggression. 49% of scenes include verbal aggression. There are 12 acts of aggression per scene on average, and then 95% of recipients of aggression were female. Right, and so, um, Best-selling pornography does tend to be more hardcore. Um, and I also want to say we are not against BDSM or any kind of kink um, that may include physical violence in it uh, when it's consensual. But when we're looking at this kind of uh, pornography, this is not what healthy BDSM pornography looks like, right? If, if we were seeing healthy BDSM pornography, it would not have 95% of the recipients uh, being women, 
right? It would be much more equally distributed. So like I said, we do believe in um, the healthy, uh, and healthy pornography and how pornography can be related to healthy sexuality. Um, and so I have some tips on here of how to find some more um, positive pornography. Um, and so one thing I wanna emphasize is paying. So um, when we're paying for pornography, that helps um, to make sure that people aren't being exploited. Uh, oftentimes that free pornography, people are being exploited in the production and creation of that porn. And paying for pornography can help uh, you know if they are or not. It's not 100% um, accurate, but it's definitely something to look for. Um, you'll also want to look for things like emphasis on female pleasure and reciprocal pleasure. Uh, there'll usually be obvious consent. Uh, there won't be fetishization of marginalized and oppressed groups. And you'll see different shapes and sizes of bodies and features. All right. So now I wanna break down the impacts of rape culture and then what we can do about it. So I've talked a little bit about rape myths, uh, but I wanna go through a few of the common rape myths that we hear. So one is that a person who has been sexually assaulted will report immediately to the police. This is not true. Uh, it's actually very rare. Um, it's, much it's much more common to not report to the police and it's also very common to report uh, late, later on. So maybe uh, five years later uh, or a delayed report is more common than reporting immediately after. Um, another common rape myth is that victims provoke sexual assault when they dress provocatively or act in a promiscuous manner, right? So many of you may have heard of this as slut shaming, right? And so this image here is from a Take Back the Night event, and it's a, a display that was created by Kick at Darkness, an organization in Arizona, um, and it's what people were wearing, uh, or a recreation of what they were wearing when they were sexually assaulted. And so you can see what someone was wearing has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not they're sexually assaulted, right? We see things from hospital gowns to um, like a hoodie and shorts to pajamas, children's pajamas, right? It doesn't matter what someone was wearing. And we also see most people lie about being sexually assaulted as a very common myth. And this is actually the most common uh, and damaging myth about sexual violence that's even common among people who respond to sexual violence, right? And so I really wanna emphasize this, that this is not true. The Department of Justice has looked into this because it's such a common myth. And they found that only two to 10% of cases that are reported to law enforcement are false reports, right? So this myth is not true at all. Uh, when we look at um, other myths, we see certain types of people can't be raped while others deserve to be raped. So if we think about all those stereotypes of who is hypersexualized in those stereotypes, those are all the people who can't deserve to be raped. Uh, that can't be raped, right? Um, if we think about those stereotypes again, we see how this myth comes about. So black women don't become as traumatized as white women. This is absolutely a myth. Trans women shouldn't be in women's only spaces because they might rape someone. So again, this is a very, very common myth. Um, and it's also not true. Right, so trans women are more likely to be harmed um, than cis women, and they're also more likely to be harmed when they do go into uh, bathrooms, right? Um, and so this is also not true, and trans women should not be denied access to women's only spaces because they are women, um, and we need to honor that. And then we see men of color are more likely to be rapists than white men, right? So we, we went through that stereotype pretty thoroughly. So we want to make sure we are unlearning uh, all of these rape myths and that we are uh, not tolerating them in the spaces that we occupy. 
I also want to talk about victim blaming. So victim blaming is when we place the responsibility on the victim for the crime or wrongdoing committed against them. And this is something that's particularly prevalent when it comes to sexual violence. So uh, saying things like, you shouldn't have been out that late. Why did you let him into the house? You shouldn't have been drinking so much. Haven't you hooked up with him before? If you were really raped, you would remember it. And there are a lot of reasons that someone would not remember their um, experience. So um, when someone experiences a traumatic event like sexual violence, oftentimes the memory is significantly impacted. Uh, and it's even more impacted if someone was using drugs or alcohol, right? So there's a lot of reasons why someone would not remember being sexually assaulted. Man up, just get over it. Why didn't you fight? I would never let someone do that to me. And this quote we have, uh, we heard from a survivor and she said her quote, trauma-informed therapist uh, said that to her. So um, obviously that therapist was not trauma-informed because many, most people don't fight back. Um, the most common response to sexual violence is actually to freeze or to experience a temporary paralysis. Um, and a trauma-informed therapist should know that. Uh, whatever, dude, you liked it. And that's why you shouldn't dress like a slut, right? So we want to uh, remove all of this from our vocabulary uh, and also be able to recognize when someone's doing that so we can hopefully call that person out or put a stop to it. When we talk about victim blaming, though, I also want to mention that survivors um, don't live in a vacuum, right? So victim blaming happens at many different levels and especially in the media. So whenever there's like a national case, there's victim blaming on social media, it's everywhere. And survivors see that, right? So not only do survivors hear it from people uh, that they have considered friends or family, people in their community, they also hear it at, on social media at this national level. So uh, the example on top here is the Steubenville trial. So in, the Steubenville, in Steubenville, Ohio, um, a, a teenage girl, a high schooler, was sexually assaulted at a party and then taken to other parties and photographed. Um, and so we have, there was a, a lot of victim blaming that went on around that case. Um, we see uh, reporting. So the school says uh, the sex abuse victim was at fault for staying silent. So that's what the school is victim blaming. And then we also have Terry Crews. So Terry Crews, um, if you didn't know, has been one of the most vocal male voices of the Me Too movement. And he's talked about how he was sexually assaulted by a producer. Um, and so these comments I took from a Facebook post of his um, where he talked about what happened to him and um, the comments are victim blaming him for uh, either trying to get money out of the situation or he's known for being very buff and muscular. Uh, and so like making fun of him for that as well, uh, like that he would allow himself to be sexually assaulted. All right. Rape culture also has some significant impacts on reporting, especially reporting to law enforcement, as well as seeking services. So, um, Sexual assault is the most underreported crime to police. 75% of sexual assaults are not reported, right? So only 25% of sexual assaults are reported at all to law enforcement. Um, when it comes to children, we, do, we see some breakdown of reporting patterns. So uh, we see that white Americans are the most likely uh, to disclose sexual violence, white American children. We also see that African-American children are more likely to disclose to family, but then less likely to report to an authority. Asian-American children are the least likely to disclose to anyone. So out of all races and ethnic groups, Asian-Americans are the least likely to disclose. Um, and then when it comes to Latino folks, Latinx folks are discouraged from disclosing due to fears of discrimination and isolation from services. For people with disabilities, um, 
NPR actually did a very in-depth uh, reports, um, or multiple, multiple reports on people with intellectual disabilities and their experiences with sexual violence. Um, and so these quotes are taken from that report. Um, and so one person said, some people with disabilities are afraid to report it because they're afraid it will make them look bad, worse than they already are, because people already look down on you because you're disabled. It felt like the world was against me, right? So all those stereotypes about disability imp like further impact victim blaming. So what are some different barriers to reporting? Um, so some could be that maybe the person doesn't recognize that they were sexually assaulted, right? Sometimes sexual violence is very, um, because of rape culture, sexual violence can be normalized um, in our lives. And we might not recognize that something's happened. Uh, we might just know that something like was uncomfortable or felt bad, but we don't necessarily recognize it as sexual violence for several years. Sometimes people just want to forget about the experience, right? They've gone through the most traumatic experience they've ever had, and they just want to forget about it and not deal with it. That's also very normal and very common. Um, some people will fear being blamed or not believed, right? This is extremely common uh, experience for many survivors that they're afraid of being blamed or not believed. Some may fear retaliation uh, from the person who caused harm. Others may feel guilty, right? Like maybe they know the person, right? Most common is to know the person. And maybe they don't want that person to get in trouble or to go to jail. They just want the violence to stop or they just want that person to like not be in their life anymore, right? And so they might feel guilty about filing charges or reporting. Um, some people may be financially dependent on the person causing harm. Um, many have disbelief in successful prosecution, which is absolutely true. Um, so out of a um, hundred uh, sexual assaults, uh, only about two um, have a successful guilty verdict right when they're reported. Um, there's also cultural considerations. Um, so we talked about some uh, already uh, and how um, different groups of people are stereotyped um, and there's also internal cultural considerations about reporting and whether or not it's acceptable or if uh, folks should keep it in the family. And then we also want to talk about bad past experience with police, right? So if someone has a criminal record, maybe they don't want to report uh, to law enforcement because they're afraid they won't be believed because of that criminal record, right? We also see um, a lot of uh, police violence that's happening, uh, especially in the Black community. Um, and that makes sense, right? If a, uh, a Black person is sexually assaulted and they don't want to report to law enforcement because of all the police violence that they are, they've experienced or their communities have experienced, that absolutely makes sense. And I want to talk a little bit more about this police violence. Um, because um, I actually, these slides are um, older, we, older than 2020, right? And I know this year, um, sexual violence, or I'm sorry, police violence has been in the news um, quite a bit uh, with George Floyd's death and Breonna Taylor. Um, but I want to emphasize that this is an ongoing crisis uh, and is not new, right? Many times people especially white people um, think that this is a new thing that's been happening, but it's not. Um, we uh, have seen the black community talking about police violence for decades, uh, if not longer, right? So these images uh, here are from the civil war, or the, sorry, the civil rights um, time, right? The civil rights protests. Uh, and they were talking about police violence during the civil rights protest protests, and this has been going on um, since the slavery time. Uh, and this has a lot of impacts, right? So the black community and brown communities are very much over criminalized. Uh, and one thing that can happen is that normal reactions to sexual violence are also criminalized. And this will disproportionately impact 
uh, especially girls of color. So what happens here is that someone experiences sexual abuse or sexual violence of some kind. They have a traumatic reaction, which is totally normal, and they have an unhealthy coping mechanism, which again, totally normal. That reaction is then criminalized, right? Um, and the cycle continues because when people are criminalized, they have an increased risk of experiencing sexual violence, right, while they're incarcerated. Um, and these two reactions that are criminalized are simple things like truancy, skipping school, running away, right? If you are running away from your uh, house where you are sexually abused on a daily basis and then you're criminalized, this has an extreme traumatic effect on many people, right? Um, so we have on the screen here, we have Santonia Brown who was um, sex trafficked and she killed her trafficker. And then she was put in prison um, for murder and has recently been released. So I, on the screen here, we have some examples um, why I didn't report, uh, because I was a party girl at university, because I went home with him, because I thought everyone would say I asked for it, because I thought it was just what happened when you partied too hard, because I thought no one would believe me. I thought I deserved it. Why I didn't report, because he's white and I'm not, that's it. Courts don't even believe white women. I don't have a chance. And then there's a hashtag, when I reported, when I reported pa my pastor's childhood rapes, the church threatened to sue me. I was called a harlot, Jezebel, spawn of Satan, heaps of hate mail, some scary. 18 Southern Baptist leaders ignored me and did nothing to stop him from children's ministry, lost family relationships, and so much more. All right, so it's incredible that people report or even disclose sexual violence at all. So kind of to sum up some of the consequences of rape culture and victim blaming that we've gone over today is our society as a whole discourages people from talking about sexual violence, saying that they are survivors or reporting. Uh, if they do, that person is frequently blamed and they're not believed. When that does happen, the survivor is even less likely to disclose that sexual violence in the future or to report if something happens again. Um, the survivor may face additional trauma because of that re-traumatization. Uh, some survivors say that the way the uh, criminal justice system has treated them was worse than the sexual assault itself. Uh, the survivor doesn't receive justice uh, within the criminal legal system or any other systems uh, and they're believed to not be deserving of justice, right? Perpetrators of violence are not held accountable for their actions, uh, either in the criminal legal system or any other way to hold them accountable. And sexual violence continues. So what can we do about this, right? What can we do to create some positive social change? So I'm gonna go through a few of these in more depth, but we can promote gender and racial justice uh, we can do our own work. We can research what gender and racial justice is uh, and listen to those who are impacted uh, by uh, rape culture, by sexism and by racism and by other forms of oppression as well. Uh, don't be a mindless consumer. So when you're watching your uh, TV shows and your movies, uh, you can look out to see if rape culture is present, if it's being perpetuated. Uh, and then maybe don't support that movie with your financial um, uh, support, right? Don't pay for that movie. Um, and then maybe pay for movies that don't uh, have those um, stereotypes in them. Um, we want to promote healthy sexuality education because uh, that is very important for both prevention of sexual violence as well as healing from sexual violence. Uh, we can do public policy advocacy. So at the coalition, we do have public policy uh, lobbyists who will go to the Capitol and go to DC sometimes to advocate for public policy uh, that is uh, helpful to survivors. 
Um, and so you can get involved in that way um, by going to our website and signing up for our public policy uh, newsletter. Um, when you hear rape myths and victim blaming, you can interrupt that, right? You can call it out and we're gonna talk more about how to do that. Um, you can be a good bystander. So you can, um, if you notice something's happening, you can intervene uh, if you feel comfortable. And then most importantly, you can believe survivors, right? So we'll talk about what to do if a friend or someone you know discloses that they've experienced sexual violence. All right, so we want to challenge victim blaming and rape myths. So one thing we can do is speak up uh, when that happens around us. Uh, now, a lot of times, especially if you work in sexual violence, this might happen a lot and you might get very tired of this. So, you know, only speak up when you feel like you are able to. Uh, one thing that can be helpful is you can validate the person who has said uh, the victim blaming or rape misstatement, statement, but then challenge that statement with facts, right? But if you validate them, sometimes they're more likely to listen to you. Um, so this is just kind of a strategy. Uh, as well as a respectful communication. That's a pretty good strategy. Of course, if you hold those oppressed identities um, or you are hearing this all the time, um, you don't have to have that respectful communication. I don't want anyone to feel like they can't communicate in whatever way feels best to them. These are just um, some tips of like how people will actually listen to you because sometimes people won't listen um, if you, aren't respectful, but you don't have to be respectful 100% of the time. Um, and then you can take them as opportunities to educate and create change, right? So if people are open to listening, you can create change in that moment, which is really cool. Uh, when it comes to being a good bystander, I also have some tips here. So we want to check in. Uh, is a good strategy. So you can check in with either the uh, person you think is being harmed or the person who is doing the harm and just say, hey, how's it going? Because like, that's just like interrupting uh, what's happening and might be enough. Um, just asking that question, that might be enough. Um, you can do a separation technique. So separation is just uh, what it sounds like. You're separating the two people. So you can ask one of them, hey, can you come help me with something? Um, so whoever you feel most comfortable approaching, um, that's probably who you would want to ask. Um, distraction can be a good technique. I think this one's particularly helpful if you know the person causing harm. Um, so you can distract them from what they're doing. Uh, like you could say, oh, look at this thing over here. Look at this thing my kid did, right? There's a bunch of different ways to distract someone. Uh, if you feel comfortable, you can also confront. Uh, some people prefer this. Some people don't, uh, you can just call it out as it is. So you can say, stop it, that's harassment. Um, some people might feel very unsafe to do that. Some people might prefer to do that. And then there's delegation. So if you are witnessing something and you just don't feel comfortable, you do not feel safe to get involved, you can find someone else to help with that situation. That might feel a little more safe or like maybe the two of you, because there's two, um, you might feel more safe with those numbers. So now we're going to watch an example video um, of some different bystander techniques. And just for some context, the video starts where um, a man and a woman come onto the train and it, the man has been following this woman around um, and she is trying to fight back against that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Go ahead. On your very way. Go ahead. 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 You're not gonna do the one. Not well, follow me. Okay, so many times. Okay, do not follow me. Okay, ma'am. No, no, no. You need to stop following. Go get on another car. When this train stops, do not follow me anymore. Do not follow me. Okay, she's she's totally following me. We, we got you on camera. Don't follow. Do not follow me. We got you. When we stop again, get off. 
All right, so in that video, we see a few different examples of um, bystander intervention. So I think um, the reason this video went viral is actually the, the guy who was eating chips. So he did the separation technique where he physically separated them just by moving into their space, right? He didn't even say anything. He just continues to eat his chips, but he is a physical barrier between the two people, right? Uh, we also see uh, there was the older black lady uh, who went up uh, and directly confronted the man about what he was doing and like gave him instructions on what to do next. Um, and then the person recording the video also, uh, that recording was an intervention strategy in and of itself. And then he also vocalized uh, that he was recording it. So he also did that direct confrontation. So um, the last thing that we wanna talk about is believing survivors. So how should I respond if someone tells me they've been sexually assaulted? So the first response to a survivor is the most important, right? A lot of research, uh, a lot of research shows that this is the most important response. Uh, and if a survivor gets a positive response, they're less likely to feel depression, anxiety, and PTSD they're more likely to get help and they're more likely to report to the police. But when survivors experience a negative response, um, that can actually have an even stronger impact on their overall well being. Right, so this positive response is really, really important. So, what's included in the positive response? So, there's four simple components. So, believe them, right? We wanna believe survivors when they tell us. It's not our jobs to investigate what happened. Uh, we want to have zero judgment, so we don't want to judge anything that the survivor tells us. Uh, we want to validate the survivor, so we want to validate their emotions, uh, their response, what they did in the situation. Uh, we want to validate and normalize that. And above all, we want to listen, right? So sometimes just listening to the survivor and validating them is really all we need to do. So some things that you can say, you can say, I believe you. Um, and I think, I always feel like awkward, like I believe you is like an awkward statement. Um, but sometimes a survivor has never heard that from someone before. And so saying that out loud um, can really be impactful. Um, you can say, thank you for trusting me. I'm so sorry this happened to you. It's not your fault. Again, it's not your fault is a really big one that survivors may not have heard before from other people. So I think it's important to verbalize that as well. Some ways to provide that emotional validation. I understand why you would feel that way. I don't blame you. That makes sense. That's terrible, right? You can also provide options um, to your friend uh, or family member if they're disclosing uh, sexual violence to you. So you could say, have you thought about talking to your friends or family? Have you thought about your different options? Have you thought about talking with a counselor? And you can follow up with, I'll support whatever you decide to do. And this is really important. So sometimes um, some of us, like especially if it's like a friend or a family member who's experienced sexual violence, like we wanna fix it, right? We wanna make the situation better. And we can't do that, right? Uh, there's nothing that we can do that's gonna undo that person being sexually assaulted, right? That's happened. Um, but what we can do is make sure that that person has all the power, uh, all the decision-making power possible. So we wanna support their decisions, even if we disagree with them, right? So maybe we're like, I think you need to talk to the police and they don't want to. We need to support them and not talking to the police. Maybe they um, really don't wanna to talk to a counselor, right? We, we wanna support them, right? And if they do wanna to talk to a counselor, we also wanna support them, right? We always just wanna make sure that they are leading uh, and that we are just offering support. 
Um, some tips uh, is to avoid asking why questions, right? Asking why questions can sound like victim blaming, even if we don't mean it as victim blaming or that's not our intention. It, it's very easy to misconstrue a why question as victim blaming. And so we wanna avoid that altogether. We also wanna avoid making excuses for the perpetrator. So saying things like, well, maybe they didn't know you didn't want to, or maybe they were just drunk and they didn't know what they were doing. Uh, we, we don't wanna do that because when we make excuses for the perpetrator, what happens is we end up minimizing our friend's experience with sexual violence, which makes us seem like we're not believing them or we're not taking it seriously. So we definitely don't wanna be doing that. So lastly, I have some resources. Um, these are specific for Southern Arizona, um, but um, some of them uh, anyone can call. So there's the University of Arizona Survivor Advocacy. Uh, so I have their contact information, their website, and their phone number. There's the Southern Arizona Center Against Sexual Assault that has a 24-7 uh, hotline available. Uh, so you can call that anytime. Uh, ACES DV, so my organization has a statewide helpline, uh, so anyone in Arizona can call the helpline, uh, and we are available Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m., and I have our phone number available, and there's also a chat available, so um, survivors can go onto our website, and there should be a pop-up that says chat with an advocate, something like that, and you can chat with someone. Uh, and then I also have RAIN. RAIN is the 24-hour national uh, sexual assault hotline. Um, and so they also have a phone option and a chat option available. All right, so um, thank you again for attending uh, this training on rape culture. Uh, my contact information is available. So please feel free to send me an email uh, if you need to get a hold of me, if you have any questions or, or any feedback on the presentation. I am very open to feedback and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Um, so thank you again for joining me.